Pete Fornatel back with you on Mixed Bag Radio with my guests today, Jim Brown, Roger McGuinn, and Pete Seeger. That's alphabetical order, in case uh, <laughs> you are wondering. One of the main reasons we're here today is to uh, talk about the new documentary, Pete Seeger, The Power of Music. But, Roger, here's a question I bet you weren't expecting me to ask you today. Why weren't the birds at Woodstock? I think we had another concert somewhere else in the country and we had no idea that Woodstock would be what it turned into so I don't remember the exact details but we were touring at the time as the birds I remember that and either we weren't invited or we turned it down I, I don't remember <laughs> you know I have no recollection of of seeing an offer for Woodstock but I, we probably played somewhere else. The, yeah, there are a lot of great stories like that where yeah. agents mi misrepresented it. They, uh, I can't remember the artist, but he got a call in Europe while on tour, and the manager or agent said, uh, "Hey, they want you to do this concert on a farm, on a yeah, cow it's farm in, the mud, in, you in know, upstate New York." The, right. And he said, "No, I'll pass." Yeah, thanks. no thanks. <laughs> uh, when did you become aware of of the phenomenon that it was, and and do you think that Woodstock still has something to say? 40 years later to, uh, to the world and to people. I I'm going to go around the table on this one, but we'll start with Roger. I became aware of it immediately after it w was a, a media sensation, which was right after it happened or during, during uh, the time it was happening. And it was um, a, a turning point. It was a, a tipping point of w where young people who had um, sort of liberal views were uh, a mass of people that had uh, gathered together in such a way to as to say to the world, look, you know, we're we're a, uh, a sizable group of people, and and our views are account for something. Take notice. A nation, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jim. Uh, all. I, go ahead, Pete. No, you go on. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, all sorts of people were surprised. People on the left and the right, and the top and the bottom. It was just an unexpected gathering. I was asked to be on it, but I couldn't make it. The Clearwater had just been built, and we were in far upstate near Albany in a little town called Castleton, and the captain said he wanted to go. I said, well, Toshi and I will make sure the boat is kept safe, and we and a few sailors uh, stayed at the dock. And the captain uh, somehow got there. He said, if I have to walk, I'm going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> came back and told us Arlo Guthrie was there. But, of course, the extraordinary thing was when it became a movie and the words were on the screen, one, two, three, what are we fighting for? Fighting that for song would have been number one on the hit parade if it had ever been played on AM radio. But you could, it was only played on college stations, maybe. Sure. It, it is one of those events in our collective history that took on a life of its own. You know, the estimates of how many were there varies wildly depending on who you're talking to. And, of course, once the movie and the album came out, it became like a, uh, you know, like if there was a song about being a rock and roll star, you know, a guidebook. So you want to be a rock and roll star. That's what Woodstock did for a whole generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I had no intention of asking you this, Roger, <laughs> but uh, music, live music has always been a part of this show. When you wrote that song, did you think that it was going to be the how-to, <laughs> or was it a little more cynical than that? It was more. It was uh, tongue-in-cheek. It was uh, meant to be humorous. It wasn't always taken that way, uh, but Chris Hill and I were sitting up at his house looking at these teenage magazines and laughing about the turnover, the quick turnover <laughs> in, in the business. You know, you'd see someone one week and they'd be gone the next. And we thought, well, let's let's write a little satirical song about it, and that was the that was the beginning of it. Would you? And well, yeah, I just want to tell you that Miller Thomas, um, I believe his he, he was Miriam McKeeba's guitar player. Yeah, and, and Harry Belafonte's too. And Harry yeah, Belafonte's yeah, yeah. right. He he did a little. Uh, let's see. Miriam would sing this thing over it, the South African lilting chant, you know, with the clicks and everything. And then I, I heard it, and I, I just loved the, the rhythm of it. I showed it to Chris Hillman, and that turned into... So you want to be a rock and roll star, then listen now to what I say. 
Just get an electric guitar and take some time and learn how to play. And when your hair's comb right and your pants fit tight, it's gonna be alright. Then it's time to go downtown where the agent man won't let you down. Sell your soul to the company who are waiting there to sell plastic wear. And in a week or two, if you make the charts, the girls will tear you apart. And then we put little screams. <laughs> <laughs> that Derek Taylor had recorded at a concert in London with a little Philips cassette recorder I had. Some group uh, called the... Uh yeah, that, at a Birds concert? Yeah, a Birds I, always, concert. I heard that it was a, a Beatles show. No, it was a Birds concert. Ah, all right. It was one of our concerts. The price you paid for your riches and fame Was it all a strange game? You're a little insane Money the king and the public acclaim Don't forget what you are You're a rock and roll star La, 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 la La, 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 la Put the screams after it. kind of fun. <laughs> Great song. Pete, I couldn't tell. Were you strumming along on that one? We might have another first no, here. No, I was just li- <laughs> I was just listening. Well, n- now you know, Pete, what you have to do if you want to be a rock and roll star. So get out there and get going. <laughs> my, my favorite line was always was always sell your soul to the company who are waiting there to sell plastic wear. I just thought, <laughs> like, nailed it, you know. <laughs> you know, w- one of the things I'd like to hear Roger and Pete talk about if we could is that both of them have uh, Roger now more than ever uh, are disseminating kind of the roots music of America. Pete started this uh, with his father uh, in the Lomaxes thinking that we had this great musical heritage that yeah. in the 30s no one really was aware of. No. And because the, of the happy music Pete was talking yeah, about. Yeah, and, and it was really Pete and, and Woody Guthrie and the Lomaxes and the Weavers that began to Bring those songs that are our heritage yes, uh, to yes. the forefront, and Roger, you're you're doing that well, now. Well, they they fostered the folk movement of the 50s and 60s, and it peaked. And you know, unfortunately, there's there's always been a balance between art and commerce, and sometimes the art factor gets outweighed by the commerce factor, and uh, that that was what was happening in the 30s, and that's what's happening today as far as traditional music. Although I, uh, thanks to to Pete's efforts and to Springsteen, we have to thank him sure. and other people. I see more traditional music being heard. But I noticed about um, in 1995 that the traditional side of folk music was being neglected by the singer-songwriters who were acoustic players. They were writing their own material, and it was in a folk vein, but it w- they weren't doing the child ballads. They weren't doing the Appalachian ballads. They weren't doing the old blues or the field hollers or the things that, the sea shanties, the cowboy songs, the wonderful work songs that we that Pete uh, taught me, you know, not personally, but I learned from him through his influence. And um, I thought I'd do something about it by starting the folk town, and that's when that started on the internet. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pete, The reason that I raised the Woodstock question was because you've had a long history of involvement with festivals, and uh, I already mentioned your intersection with rock and roll on a couple of occasions, uh, certainly with the birds, and uh, one of them happened at Newport, and we've talked about this before. I've talked to other eye and ear witnesses about it. And, of course, I'm referring to Dylan's appearance the year that he plugged in, as the phrase goes. In the recent... 1955. 65. 65. 65. But what's a decade between friends? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Let me get my thought back. Scorsese's documentary about Dylan covered facets of that story but left it pretty ambiguous. You know, there, the, the, the urban legend, or in this case, I guess the country legend, is that you actually had an axe and were looking for the power <laughs> cord to cut. And I think that's <laughs> not, I, I mean, my recollection is that there was no real axe. There was something that you said, but for a very specific reason, not about the, uh, you know, not about Dylan plugging in, but about the way that it was affecting a member of your family. Have I got my facts straight here? Well, uh, first place, I was asked to be the master of ceremonies that evening. I remember 
opening up the evening playing a tape recording of my newly born niece going, ah, uh, and saying, what have we got to say to this kid just starting her life? And uh, then later that, uh, in the first half of the evening, on comes Bob, and they spent about five minutes uh, tinkering with the microphones to getting them the way they wanted it. But when I heard them sing, I couldn't understand a single word. It was so distorted. <laughs> and I ran over to the sound man uh, at the, uh, and said, fix the PA system so we can understand the words. And he shouted back, no, this is the way they want it. And I was <laughs> so mad, I said, damn it, if I had an ax with me, I'd cut the cable. I was really mad. I wasn't however, not, not mad at using microphones, though. Howling Wolf would use uh, all sorts of electronic uh, music just a little while before. I think it was largely a myth, actually, that's been perpetrated. Some people yeah. have asked why it's not in the film. And, uh, and, uh, I, th I think Scorsese stroked that matter of fact, it was one of, one, one, of, uh, one, one of Bob's <laughs> better songs. It was a wonderful song. Uh, uh, Maggie's Farm was the name of the song he was singing mm -hmm. at the time. Wonderful song. In the Scorsese documentary, you know, Bob, who has uh, cloaked himself in, in such mystery so well for so many years, you can't put yourself before the camera like that and not reveal something. And when he's talking about that incident, he is so sheepish about it because someone, you know, it must have gotten back to him that someone he admired so much and so deeply was, uh, was cross with him in some sense for uh, doing that at the Newport Folk Festival. And I just thought that was a, a revealing moment about him that I hadn't, hadn't quite seen before and that I thought you would probably be touched by. Yeah, I was. I think that there had been quite a bit of electronic music at Newport before that. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think John Sebastian told me Love and Spoonful played the year before, but no one noticed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I think that, you know, all the blues musicians that, that uh, were there were electronic. What One of the things I heard was that Pete was concerned that his father was backstage who had a hearing aid and that he wouldn't be able to hear things, but I, I don't think Pete was wielding an axe and all the well, things that, that are, 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 um, are um, kind of the myth of, of the occasion. <laughs> I, I wanted to get the definitive uh, version out there today, Pete, and far be it for me to correct you, but I think now, <laughs> hearing the story again, I realize what your mistake was. You said to the sound guy, if I had an axe, you should have said, if I had a hammer. <laughs> <laughs>